Hello and welcome. I'm David Greenberg and my website is freedomvibe.art. If you've been following my work already, I want to welcome you back. And if you're brand new to my work, welcome as well. I am a multimedia artist, a video content creator, and an educator. The topics that I discuss include natural law, the occult sciences, nature, psychology and mindset, health, healing and nutrition, consciousness, spirituality, and of course, freedom. Today's presentation, The Trivium, a masterclass on discerning truth from lies. This presentation has been designed to be appropriate for people of all ages, children and adults. The lesson it contains is important also for people of all ages. So I want to invite you to watch it together with your kids or perhaps watch it first and then invite your children to watch with you. So who is this for? This is for you if you want to experience more freedom in life and if you want to suffer less. Whatever that means for you. And I realize that you, just like me and everyone else, we're all individuals and we have our unique experience. So what I want to do is invite you to check in with yourself and see how relevant this is for you so that you can get the most out of this lesson. As is my custom, I would like to start off this presentation by sharing a couple of quotes that I've curated about truth. I think these quotes will really help you to get into the mood and mindset of what we're going to discuss today. And as I read each of these quotes, I want to invite you to feel into the deeper truth there rather than simply relating to them intellectually. The truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it. Flannery O'Connor pointing, of course, to that deeper truth that truth is objective and is not based on how you feel about it. This is a mistake that a lot of people make and through ideologies such as solipsism and postmodernism, many people fall into the trap of thinking that if something makes them feel uncomfortable or makes them feel bad, in their in their own estimation then it can't be true and they can simply ignore it or consider it irrelevant for them and in fact this is a great formula for suffering all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered the point is to discover them Galileo Galilei this of course points to the deeper truth that truth is discoverable. In other words, belief is irrelevant in context. And I personally do not value belief except for belief in oneself to do what is required in order to interface with reality and learn what we need to learn in order to grow and evolve. This is pointing to the fact that truth is discoverable. It's based on knowledge. It's based on the acquisition of knowledge, what we can learn what we can come to understand. And it is also accessible to us. It is not something that is locked away deep in recesses of reality that is simply that we simply cannot obtain. It is actually at hand. It is available to us. And often it is much closer than we think it is. We simply need to be willing to reach out and learn. We need to be able to reach out and explore the reality that we find ourselves in. Another great quote, truth exists, only falsehood has to be invented. George Brack. In my estimation, this pretty much about sums up the nature of the current condition that we are living in. And if you look with objective eyes and with discernment at the world around us, all the institutions that we find ourselves embroiled within, you can see that there are so many machinations and it's like a giant house of cards and there's so much complexity 
because it's all based on lies and falsehood. Whereas truth shines through as being very simple, simple and easy to see, and it exists, exists inherently in nature. It's not something that has to be invented or fabricated. Those who have failed to work towards the truth have missed the point of living, Buddha. Isn't that so powerful? We are here to gain knowledge. We are here to be on the path of discovering what is actually true. That is the essence of who we are and why we are here. That may not be the entirety of it, but that is a large part of it. And someone who goes through life in ignorance and not even making an effort towards understanding what is true in the world has really missed the whole point of living. And I can tell you from personal experience that's something that that's a path that I was on for a long time until I had to basically recognize that in myself and pick myself up and correct my path and choose consciously choose of my own will to take another path and I can tell you once I made that change the magic of life has opened up in a way that I could could have scarcely imagined beforehand. So now I have a question that I'd like to ask you. Do you want to learn the truth about yourself and about nature, about the world around you? Do you want to learn the truth? Why or why not? I want to invite you to really contemplate the question and the answer for yourself. Whatever your answer you come up, that will be relevant for you. I want to invite you to really go into this lesson having thought this through, having really given it consideration. Even if it's the first time in your life that you've asked yourself this question, it's a really important question for you to ask yourself. And if you want to share your answers, that's great, but that's not required. Because really, this is a question that you're asking yourself for yourself, so that you can come to know yourself better. Okay, so let's talk about what the trivium is. Let's start to deepen our understanding as we, as we move further into this lesson. So what is the trivium? It is an occult science. The word occult, comes from the Latin, as with many words in our language. It comes from Latin occultus, which is an, a, an adjective, hidden. It also comes from a Latin verb, occultare, which means to hide or to conceal. These two words in Latin, in fact, are derived from a third word, a noun in Latin, oculus, which means the eye. Now, if you have been following my work, the occult knowledge and the occult is not going to be a new concept to you. But if you're brand new to this concept, and if it makes you nervous or uncomfortable, I'd like to add a little bit of context because there's really nothing to be afraid of here. There's nothing to, to be concerned about. It's simply a misunderstanding. A good question to ask is, why is occult knowledge occult? Why, in other words, why is it hidden? How and why is it hidden? Well, occult knowledge is hidden because it's largely ignored. Not because it's locked up in some kind of ethereal box or some kind of supernatural container that makes it inaccessible. It is hidden because it is largely ignored or not recognized. How is that done? People are distracted. We are distracted and dissuaded from studying it. Instead, we're taught to fear it. And you can check the truth of this by identifying your own reaction, your own initial reaction to the word. And as a result, most people are apathetic about it. They don't really care. They're not really interested in understanding what is the occult. As you're going to discover as we move into this, 
this is actually a big mistake because doing so will comprise an obstacle on the path to discovering the truth. And as I said, there is nothing to be afraid about. There's nothing to fear. This is simply a body of knowledge. Now, if you are brand new to the occult sciences, and they are sciences, by the way, they are sciences because they are based on knowledge and they are based on principles which can be reproduced through experimentation. And hence, they are also discoverable. So I talk a lot about occult sciences as part of my work, and I will continue to deepen my both my own understanding and what I share. But at a high level, we can say that the occult sciences are dealing with two realms, what we can call the microscopic realm, which is also known as the lesser arcana from the occult traditions. And this refers to the world of the human psyche, your mind, what goes on inside your mind, how you operate as a human being, a topic that I've discussed extensively in my other presentation called Understanding Human Nature. And then there is the other aspect of the occult sciences, which we can call the macroscopic realm or the greater arcana. And this refers to the world around us, the laws of nature, how nature operates, but from a much deeper level than we are used to discerning it if we just stop at the point of the known physical sciences that, that most of us have grown up understanding. So the purpose of this masterclass is to reveal or unveil, if you will, occulted knowledge and in doing so, to help you discover the truth for yourself. Earlier, as I read some of these quotes to you in the beginning, I made some comments about belief versus knowledge. And I want to kind of add a little fine point to this. Belief is often imposed through violence, whereas knowledge is always acquired as an act of love. And when I say love, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not even talking about brotherly love. I'm talking about the love of creation, the love of truth, which has also been called agape, the love of creation itself. So we have a strong contrast here. And I'm not saying that there is no place at all for any kind of belief. Sure, you should believe in yourself. You should believe in your ability to acquire knowledge as a starting point. But belief is not a substitute for knowledge. And that is one of the biggest mistakes that, that in my estimation, that people make on this path. Let's talk a little bit about green language. You may or may not have already been introduced to this concept, but if you're not, if you're not, then I think this is going to really help you deep your un deepen your understanding of many concepts that we encounter as we grow and evolve in the world. So what is green language? Green language is a way to reveal deeper truths about particular concepts through a slight manipulation to the spelling and or the pronunciation of a given word. So in a way, green language is kind of like creation winking at us and saying, here's another way to understand that. Here's a deeper meaning related to that concept, if you're paying attention. So in green language, let's look at the word believe. Believe is be the lie, Eve. Be the lie, Eve. And just before I explain this, I want to say that I'm not coming at this from any kind of religious perspective. So don't make any pres presuppositions. Don't make any assumptions. Just listen and hear what I'm saying. So what does this mean, be the lie, Eve? Well, Eve refers to the goddess, to 
the feminine, the divine feminine, the generative principle of creation. Again, if you have studied the Kabbalion, which I highly recommend that you do, that you read that book, and the Hermetic Principles, you will recall that the seventh principle is the principle of gender. Is that there are masculine and feminine attributes to everything in creation, including all of creation itself. And the feminine aspect of creation, which we can call the goddess, is where it is all generated from. It's where birth of creation, of reality, comes into. It's related to care, what we care about. So belief hijacks care. It hijacks the generative principle. And this is why and how belief gives birth, instead of to beauty and wonder and truth and all things good, now it can give birth to violence and suffering, to evil, to harm, to things which aren't based on truth. So there is nothing to believe in this presentation. And I want to invite you to feel into that truth. I'm here simply sharing knowledge, the truth of which you can validate for yourself, and you should. You shouldn't believe a single word I say. Don't believe me. Instead, simply take in what I'm saying into consideration. Take it into consideration and then go off and validate it through your own experience, through your own research, through your own education, through continued study, maybe even experimentation in your own life. But I'm not here to share anything that you should believe in. I'm here simply to point the way to knowledge. Okay, so now let's start to understand the word trivium itself and what its meaning is. So the word trivium is a Latin noun. Again, going back to the Latin, a path that we're going to walk on many times. What does this word mean? It literally means a place where three roads meet. Basically an intersection between three roads. And it's actually a derived word. It's derived from the prefix tri or tree, T-R-I, which means three, and from via or via, which means a path, a road, or a way. So what exactly is the trivium in context? Well, it is a classical learning tool. It is a classical learning tool that is used to validate new knowledge and in order to gain an understanding of ourselves, the inner domain, the microcosm, and of the world around us, the macrocosm or the greater arcana. It is also a key that unlocks the mysteries of the universe. Furthermore, it is a sword that defends us from the enemies of truth and freedom. This simple tool, which basically requires no technology at all other than the use of our own mind, has the ability to help you obtain an understanding of yourself and of reality that is tremendous, that is much greater and much deeper than you may have even imagined. And it's going to help you face the natural enemies of truth that are going to come up in your life, the things that are going to attempt to derail you from the path. And you're going to develop a natural ability to defend yourself and in order to maintain your integrity and keep moving forward on this path. As the name suggests, it's a three-step process. And of course, we're going to dive in shortly to understand what those three steps are, the nature of each of those steps, how they operate, and how we can employ them as part of using the trivium. It's also very important to understand and to keep in mind 
that these steps should always be followed in order, in the order that they are presented. Steps should never be omitted or skipped, and we should never attempt to change the order of, of executing this process. Now I'm going to make a bold statement here that I'd like to invite you to consider. And as always, feel into the truth of this and understand it holistically. When people fall prey to lies and deception, it is largely because they fail to apply the trivium process to their thinking. Now I know that's kind of a bold claim and I will need to back that up. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. And as we continue through this lesson and break down the different steps of the trivium and then how to use it, I think that you will come to see how that is. But basically, people fall prey to lies and deceptions because they don't know how to discern them. They don't know how to discern truth. They don't know how to think objectively. And this is one of the main reasons why I'm doing this, to help level the playing field. Because if you have any hopes of defending yourself against those lies and deceptions and basing your path on truth, then you're going to need to be able to use tools like this. So what are these three steps of the trivium? Well, in the classical interpretation, the three steps are called grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Classical interpretation in context simply refers to the fact that these, the trivium was a tool of learning that was employed, for example, in ancient Roman times and long before that. That is simply, actually that is a very, fairly recent in history example of the use, but we call it classical because it was part of the classical period. So the three steps in context are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. There is a more contemporary interpretation. They are the same three steps we're simply giving them a more contemporary label. And I think that you'll be able to relate to this being a part of the modern age of information and computation. So those more contemporary labels are input, processing, and output. Most people, including children and adults today, are very familiar with, and in fact, probably very comfortable with working with computers. So these labels will probably make sense, make a lot of sense intuitively based on that experience. And there is in fact another interpretation, one that I like to use a lot. And in this interpretation, the three steps are called knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Now, if you've been paying attention even though I haven't even started to explain the details of each of these steps, just through the labels, just through recognizing certain aspects of each label, you're probably already starting to get it. And I know that certain people watching this will have already come into contact with the trivium, but I'm referring to you, maybe this is the first time that you've even heard of the concept. You're probably already starting to see and grasp in your mind, even before my detailed explanation, of what these steps are. And if you are, that's great. And if not, don't worry, you're gonna get it. You, you will be able to get it. Again, just to hammer this point home because it's so, so important. The order that we take these steps in is crucial. It is a requirement to follow that order. It's probably pretty obvious if you think about it, even for a minute, that you're not going to be able to understand something you don't know. And you're not going to be able to act wisely unless you first understand what needs to be done. All right, now we are ready to discuss and understand the first step, which is the grammar step, also known as the input step or the knowledge step, depending on which nomenclature you prefer. So this is the step where we acquire new knowledge and new information, as the name suggests. 
This is a step where we're taking that information into ourselves and getting ready to process it in a way that is meaningful, in a way that we can arrive at an accurate understanding of what we are actually looking at, what we're learning. Education is the key to unlock a golden door of freedom. George Washington Carver. I thought I would throw in this additional quote here in context because I think it really illustrates how crucial and important this step is. And also it sheds light on what the true meaning of education is. In fact, the word education itself also come coming from the Latin educare, which basically means to lead out of. To lead out of what? To lead out of the darkness and into the light. To lead through the door, the golden door of freedom. So I want to invite you, as always, to feel the deeper truth that is resonating within those words. So what is actually taking place in this first step of the trivium? In the grammar step, we are taking in new knowledge without immediately accepting or rejecting it. See, this is the critical, this is the crux right there. That's the main distinction. That's the point where most people, or many people at least, are getting tripped up. I would argue most people based on my own experience. And I would include myself in the past in that before I came to understand this. You're taking the knowledge in but you're not immediately accepting or rejecting it. This is the notion of entertaining ideas, taking them under consideration. Then, as we move through the trivium, as we get deeper into the process, then we will either keep certain ideas or discard them based on what, what we're able to learn and what we're able to understand. So yes, eventually we will come to a decision but we don't immediately reject it. So what is knowledge? Knowledge, like a lot of concepts in the modern world, has gotten a bad rap. And uh, again, if you're talking about solipsism or postmodernism or different types of thinking, even the New Age movement, certain New Age, uh, I would say a large amount of the New Age religion, tends to reject the importance of knowledge. So what exactly is knowledge? Knowledge is organized information. Knowledge allows us to build a working model of reality and then to interact with that reality in a meaningful and predictable manner. That is all knowledge is, it is the interface. It is the inner mapping within our mind, within the inner domain a mo mapped model of the reality we find ourselves in based on our current understanding. And of course, as with any model, that model can is subject to change. And that's the whole point. That's the point of the trivium is that we are improving and refining our model as we go on and that allows us to make better and better decisions. All knowledge is neutral. Knowledge itself is neither good nor evil. It's what we do with it that makes it either good or evil. It's the actions that we take. Something I've talked about extensively on nearly every one of my videos and presentations. It's worth repeating though. The knowledge itself is neutral. That's why it's incorrect to outrightly reject new knowledge just because we're afraid of it or we think it's evil or something. No. Even knowledge of evil is simply knowledge. We can become aware and we should become aware of evil and wrongdoing. That doesn't make us evil or wrong just because we're aware of it. It actually puts us in a powerful position to make better choices with respect to that harm or evil, including putting a stop to it. My position is we should always be open to acquiring new knowledge. In fact, it's a never ending process. So let's look at the contrast to knowledge. And that is the state of ignorance. Or, as Mark Passio calls it, ignorance. 
because right there in the word is the word ignore because that is what is happening we are ignoring information ignorance and ignorance or ignorance if you prefer is the negative expression of the grammar step it's the inverted grammar step in other words it's the refusal and that's what it is it's a, it's an objective refusal of learning new information it is the willful rejection of knowledge despite the fact that that information is being is available and is being made available it's available to you you can learn it but you re willfully you meaning the ignorant person willfully chooses to reject it for, based on whatever agenda based on whatever feelings or emotions whatever is going on inside you, the psyche of the person that person is choosing to ignore it and this is something that happens on a very very large scale this is not a occasional problem this is a an epidemic this is likely the mindset of the majority of human beings right now and we're gonna as we move further in you're gonna see why this is such a dangerous mindset and what the consequences of such a mindset are certain religions and ideologies I would maybe even modify that to say all religions and ideologies or most certain religions and ideologies which include the new age or again what some people have called the new cage and postmodernism reject knowledge in favor of emotions think about that they claim that you can think based on how you feel and learning is discouraged you don't need to learn that just do what makes you feel good just do what makes you feel good pursue the pleasure they may not say it in those exact words but that is essentially the underlying ideology and belief and this is of course leading more and more towards a form of pure egotism which is essentially Satanism because Satanism as we have seen is an ancient ancient religion or ideology the first tenet of which is that the self comes first self-preservation is the highest law of creation and all else be damned so you can see what direction that leads can lead and does lead a society in when people think this way now there is something that underlies ignorance as well or ignorance something that gives birth to it and that of course is cowardice cowardice fear a fear-based mindset being afraid being afraid to do what is right being afraid to even face what is right and what is true and we can see this very clearly because a person who has courage is never going to willfully reject knowledge it's not going to happen a person who is courageous is not going to say oh I don't need to know that it's incompatible a person cannot be encouraged and be willfully rejecting knowledge because again knowledge is neutral it's neither good nor evil so there's no reason to re to just reject it outright except out of ignorance born of cowardice okay so you might be saying well that's all well and good David but how do we acquire knowledge as I said earlier this is not advanced technology this is actually very basic so we acquire knowledge in the way that we always do through the senses and through new and old ways of inputting information so reading reading is timeless do you read books I'm curious maybe comment below the video do you read and if so what what's a, a recent book that you read that you found to be very informative I read all the time I've gone through phases in my life where I've read I read more and less and now I'm kind of re-entering a new phase where I've been reading more and sometimes I'm reading several books at the same time I know that some people don't like that I happen to enjoy that process so I might read a book and then start reading another one and then go back to the first one that's just how I read 
you may do it differently. But reading is amazing. There's nothing, you know, there are a few pleasures in life that equate to curling up with a good book, even when it's quiet, there's no sound, maybe not even any music, and it's just you and the book. It's a very powerful way to read, to uh, acquire knowledge. Watching videos, just like you're doing right now. This is the modern way, a modern way to acquire knowledge, and it's a great way, and it's very powerful. Again, when you make good choices about what to watch, and I think you've made a great choice in today's video, and hopefully you'll continue to do that because there is obviously, again, there's a lot of information out there that maybe isn't that important or relevant, but there's also very important and very relevant information. What's another way? Engaging in conversation or discussion. What a powerful way, direct interface with others. Sharing ideas, exchanging ideas, exchanging knowledge. Maybe a slightly more one way, is listening to a lecture. Again, this video is kind of like a lecture because I'm doing all the talking and you're doing essentially all the listening. We can interact through the comments and otherwise, but it is kind of a one-way, mostly a one-way exchange. But we can also have those two-way exchanges and I enjoy, I for one enjoy conversations tremendously when they're on the level. So, and so on and so forth, and you can think of others, maybe listening to a podcast, similar to watching a video, but with just the audio component. Whatever other means that you can think of, these are all valid ways to acquire knowledge, and they're all, as you can see, fairly low-tech. They're simply interfacing your senses with the external reality in order to bring new information inside of you. I would even say, if we want to get into a little more of an advanced way to acquire knowledge, I would add grounding, in other words, putting your bare feet on the ground, on the earth, is, is also a form of knowledge acquisition because in addition to receiving the electrons that you need to balance out your body from the earth, you will also potentially receive information, as I have, directly from the earth. So I would add that as a way. And I would also say that eating, what we eat and drink, also contains information because everything in physical reality is and contains information. So in a way, even eating f food from nature is a way of acquiring knowledge, albeit at a more fundamental level. So let's talk about teachability. What is teachability? Teachability is simply a measure of how effective you are in learning new knowledge in, in acquiring new information. And teachability occurs on a bell curve. I think we're all familiar with the bell curve. On each end you have kind of the lesser um, amount and then as you move towards the middle of the bell curve you have the greatest number of occurrences. So when we talk about teachability that's exactly what happens. So imagine on one side, we'll call it the left side of the curve, you have what's called rigid skepticism. This is basically where you're pretty much rejecting all new knowledge outright. Particularly if you don't like the sound of it, if you don't like the way it makes you feel and so forth, or if it just doesn't seem plausible to you. You're pretty much just rejecting it all. On the other side, on the right side of this curve, you have naive acceptance. This is pretty much where you just believe everything you're told. You don't have any kind of filter. Ah, if, if, if they said it's true, then it must be true. You can n recognize that this is very related to the religious mindset, where people just tend to believe things because it's part of a dogma. So these endpoints, as the curve suggests, are very low levels of teachability. The sweet spot, the place where the most learning occurs, is actually right at the top of the bell curve and, and close to that. And that is where you are highly teachable. What does that mean that you are highly teachable? It means that you have some level of skepticism. Yes, you are not automatically going to believe what you're not automatically going to accept as true what you're learning, but you're also not going to immediately reject it either. You're simply going to, as we said earlier, entertain the idea, entertain the possibility what some people have called provisional faith. 
You're going to go along with it in the meantime in order to see how it plays out until you're able to come to a conclusion. And this is high teachability. And this is what I want to encourage you to be, to embody, in order to maximize your learning, and in order to maximize your ability to discern the truth and to make the best choices. All right, now we are ready to dive into the second step of the trivium. So we already, we've already learned about the first step, which is the grammar step. Now we're ready to learn the logic step. This is the step where some real magic starts to occur, some real alchemy within our inner domain. This is where we apply our intelligence in order to filter, process, and organize the knowledge that we've acquired. And this is what allows us to gain a correct understanding of that knowledge, of that information. And that is why this step is also called processing because we are now processing that information in order to arrive at a conclusion and also why it's called understanding because we are now learning gaining an understanding of what we've learned in order to deepen and, and deepen that understanding in order to be able to act accordingly down the road what would be an example of how we use logic well, one great example, which is one of the most common ways, is to weed out inconsistencies and obviously false information in order to arrive at an accurate, or I would say a more accurate understanding of the truth. Because again, this is a never ending process of approximation and we're constantly improving our model, our internal model. So. When we can identify something that is obviously false, that is inconsistent, that is illogical, as it were, that doesn't fit in, we're gonna no longer take that into consideration because it's obviously false. Understanding is holistic. What do I mean by that? You're gonna draw on different sources in order to synthesize this information. So, that include things like what you already know, what you've learned in the past, pure logic or reason, your experiences, how you feel, your emotions, your intuition, that sixth sense, that inner knowing. So all of these things come to bear. No one of them is the entire picture. And that's really important to keep in mind. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that it, people make, again, is that they rely solely on one or the other. So for example, only relying on logic and not taking anything into account with respect to how you feel or your intuition. Or on the other side, trying to think with your emotions and ignoring or rejecting logic. So to really properly employ the logic state, even though the name itself is logic, even though the name itself is logic, and that would seem to imply that it's only about logic, the truth is that it is holistic. And when you're able to draw upon all these different sources in a multi-dimensional manner, you're going to be able to gain the best level of understanding. So again, understanding is not a purely intellectual or left brain paradigm. And in fact, one can never really come to fully understand neither themselves nor reality purely through intellect. This is the bane of the psychopath. I've talked about psychopaths many times. I'm referring specifically to primary psychopaths, but also secondary. Primary being people who are actually born with, the, with an incapable, with no capability of, of accessing emotion or intuition. It's all pure logic, it's pure intellect. But even people who aren't like this, who are like you and I and do have the, that capacity, because of the way our world is structured, because of the way society is structured, there's a push to only focus on the intellect or the left brain. You have organizations like Menza, you have the 
IQ test or the intelligence quotient test. It's not an intelligence quotient test, it's an intellect quotient test because it's testing your left brain abilities. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not holistic, it's not true intelligence. And a lot of people are stuck in the left brain, what has been called the prison of the left brain. So if that's where you're at, unfortunately, as long as you stay there, your, your ability to truly understand what you're learning is going to be handicapped. It's going to be hindered and you're going to always fall short of a true and deep understanding of knowledge. So what is the negative expression of logic? We talked about ignorance as the negative expression of knowledge or grammar. Well, it's laziness. The negative expression of logic is laziness, which is a failure to properly vet the information. So how is this laziness expressed? Again, think about the edges of the bell curve of teachability. That's where you're at. So when people are lazy, they'll simply just reject knowledge. They can't be bothered to vet it. Or on the other extreme, they'll just accept it all. Because again, they can't be bothered to vet it. Laziness. What is the underlying mental state that generates laziness? It's none other than apathy. A lack of care. I don't care. Imagine that. See, care is so, so important. Care has been called the generative principle of creation. And if you think about it, it makes sense because in your own life, if you really pay attention, you will notice that the things that you do, the things that you make happen, are exactly the things that you care about and vice versa. When you don't really care about something, it's not gonna happen. So apathy is the lack of care. It's the death of care. And apathy is the fertile ground upon which laziness is cultivated. But there's a deeper state, deeper psychological state, even beyond apathy, that it's important to understand in context. And this is something that I've also talked about in other presentations and will continue to talk about because it's really important. What, it, what generates this state of apathy? Why, why would someone not truly care? Well, it's a product of self-loathing. It's when the person doesn't truly love or respect themselves deep inside. And I say deep inside because sometimes that state is buried within the psyche and is not readily apparent. It's not like they're sitting there looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, I don't really like myself or I hate myself. It's rarely expressed in such a overt and direct way, but it's in there. It's in the psychological, it's deep within the psyche, usually running as programs within the subconscious mind and something that has been programmed over a long period of time. And we won't be able to dive in deep to the causes of that in this presentation, but that is something that is important to consider and I will be giving it some consideration as I have. But it's important for now to understand that when a person doesn't truly love or respect themselves deep inside, for whatever reason, then they become, they are more likely to become apathetic and therefore more likely to become lazy in how they vet the information and the knowledge that they gain. We can see this apathy, this, this laziness reflected in the language that people use. So think about how many times you've heard expressions like these in your lifetime, or even if you're being honest with yourself, how many times you've said something like this. I don't really care about that. That doesn't resonate with me. I'd rather remain ignorant about that. Pure laziness and pure apathy. And ultimately, deep down inside, lack a true lack of self-love and self-respect. And just like I said in the beginning of the presentation, this mindset 
can only lead inevitably to more suffering and less freedom. Since this step of the trivium is so important, this logic step, let's discuss a few tools that's going to allow us to gain an accurate and correct understanding of this new knowledge. In other words, let's deepen our understanding of this step. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. I'm simply going to highlight some of what I consider to be the most important tools for your consideration. I also wanted to mention that many of these tools work through a process called apophysis. In other words, don't do this. In other words, they teach you what to do by explaining what you shouldn't do or what you should remove or by what isn't true through negation. And this is one of the most powerful tools that is often neglected as part of the occult sciences, and that is apophysis, learning through negation. What apophysis is doing is it's helping us to eliminate what is incorrect and false so that we can more easily arrive at an accurate understanding of the truth and we can improve our model faster and with more effectiveness. The first example is, of course, process of elimination. It's when we discard information that we've already determined, that we already know is false or inconsistent or incorrect. The gardener already knows, hopefully, or can know, to distinguish between the weeds and the specific plants that he or she is looking to cultivate. Knowing this, he or she can easily weed or remove the weeds from the garden. So in the same way, through process of elimination, if we can already objectively understand some, some prior knowledge, some prior information, then we can apply that immediately in order to discard things that in the new information are inconsistent. So let's take an example from the September 11th event, September 11th, 2001. And I'm fully aware that this is an event that is emotionally charged for many people. And I actually chose it specifically for this reason, because again, part of this, this lesson is to help you to learn to think not only with your emotions, but actually to truly think. So let's look at this. Let's look at just one small angle of this particular event. In September 11th, there is an official narrative. That is the basically the government published narrative of what actually happened on that day. Well, you and I, using the trivium, we can handily discard the entire official narrative as false, as lies, as propaganda. Why and how? Because we know, for example, that Jet fuel, jet fuel is a known source. It's a known substance. It has known properties that we can, even if you haven't worked directly with jet fuel, you can research this or speak to those who have. And based on that research, we know that jet fuel cannot melt steel. It specifically cannot melt the steel beams of modern skyscraper. It, not even close, not even close. It's physically impossible through all of the known sciences. Just based on that alone, we know that there were other forces in play. We may or may not be able to conclude exactly what those forces are without doing more of a deep dive investigation, which is worthwhile and has been done. But we can certainly discard the entire official narrative based on that. And that puts us in a very strong position because now we're no longer going to go along with that narrative. And instead, we're going to approach it with a fresh set of eyes. Another aspect of this, which is equally as important, is we know from basic physics that a building cannot physically pancake, meaning fall into its footprint vertically at free fall speed or near free fall speed, meaning basically no resistance, without some kind of accelerating force to speed up that process to basically to remove the resistance of the floors below the one that is falling or or the ones that are accumulating because 
when we talk about pancaking, basically the material from each floor is accumulating as it falls. So from the videos of the event, we can get we can estimate to a very accurate degree approximately how long it took for the entire building to fall and we can see that it's falling essentially at free fall speed which is physically impossible unless there is some unknown accelerating force some other process in play that is removing the resistance from each subsequent floor to allow that to happen so again based on this and the jet fuel premise based on these two very important piece of information, we can basically throw away the entire official narrative about September 11th, 2001. And then we can, and then for, based on our further desire to learn what happened, we can go back and continue to research that event. Now I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm not gonna dive in deeper to this. this. That event is worthy of an entire presentation of its own, maybe many, perhaps I will do that. Many other researchers have done a great job, so I'm not really certain if that's something I'm going to dive in deeper to, but I just wanted to illustrate how we can use the process of elimination with respect to something so important. What is another tool that we can use in the apophysis to improve our ability to understand this new knowledge? It is what I've already alluded to a couple of times if you were paying attention, and that is to eliminate emotional thinking. Emotional thinking is when we attempt to determine the veracity of information based solely or largely on how it makes us feel. And we can see this reflected in expressions like, that makes me feel uncomfortable, so I'd rather not look into it. Or I don't like how that makes me feel, so that can't be true. This is a logical fallacy. You cannot think solely with your emotions. You cannot arrive at the truth solely through how things make you feel. So simply by eliminating this emotional thinking, we are able to better understand what is going on around us. Let's use an example from New Age thinking. In the New Age religion, one of the primary premises of that religion is that we should ignore the negative. Imagine that, ignore the negative. There's that word ignore from ignorance. We should remain ignorant or ignorant of so-called negative events. And the underlying belief, which is false, of course, but I'm going to state it here so that we can examine it. The underlying belief of that religion is when we focus on these negative events, such as a terrorist attack, that's going to only make those events more likely to occur. This is incorrect. The correction is, by examining such events objectively, in order to determine their causes, in other words, what actually caused these events to occur, we are actually in a position to prevent them from occurring. And then we are able to better defend ourselves when they do. So let's take another example that's related to contemporary society and contemporary events, something that we can all, that we're all familiar with. And that has to do with the notion of gun control. So when we're able to eliminate emotional thinking, we're, it allows us to reject this notion of gun control, that such a, such a thing can even exist. Despite the fact that it's perfectly valid to have strong feelings about any particular event that may have occurred in society, any, any so-called shooting event or mass shooting event where someone, some individual or group of individuals went and wrongfully murdered other people. That is obviously and naturally going to generate strong feelings. However, when we eliminate emotional thinking, despite how we feel about these events, we know that the right to self-defense is unalienable. And I've talked a lot about rights in my work up until now. If you haven't watched it, you may want to go back and check out my presentation called Knowing Your Rights. But basically, the discerning mind or having a discerning mind allows you to realize that 
No one has a right to control your use of a gun or anything, so long as you are using it rightfully and correctly. And what somebody else does over there doesn't give another group of people over here who call themselves the government or any other entity the right to come along and restrict your ability to use that gun in self-defense. So this is the uncoupling of emotional thinking. We can still feel and we should, you know, if you're not a psychopath, you should, you will feel bad for victims of any kind of violence. But that does not automatically lead you to a logical, in, illogical conclusion that somehow now tyrants have a right to remove your guns and you remove your ability, your natural and unalienable right to defend yourself. The short of it is that we are eliminating emotional thinking in order to think through this entire scenario in a very logical way. A third tool is, which is fairly similar, I will admit this is, this can be somewhat nuanced is to eliminate what's called confirmation bias. And this is related to emotional thinking. Confirmation bias is when, instead of being open to examining information with it from an impartial perspective, we tend to go and look or cherry pick the specific evidence that supports whatever preconceived beliefs or ideas that we have about that information about certain events, about circumstances, about processes. So one example is people who are strongly advocating for plant-based eating, what has also been called vegan, a plant-based diet, they will keep looking for information that supports that premise and they will continue to ignore, there's that word again, to ignore or discard the very real and very clear information that points to the fact that such a diet is destitute of nutrition from a human perspective and that it is not the natural human diet. This is confirmation bias. I know that I'm picking topics that are quite big and if we got sidetracked we could go down a, a lot of rabbit holes or we could go explore these topics in depth but for the purposes of today's presentation I simply want to mention them in context and leave the door open to diving deeper into any of these topics in future videos but this is an example of confirmation bias and one of the reasons I mentioned this one in particular it's not just because I want to rag on vegans. I myself used to think this way. I myself attempted to, I had a lot of confirmation bias around my eating habits. In, not just from a, a plant-based perspective, but even consuming sugar and carbohydrates, something that I've talked about and will continue to talk about even more in upcoming presentations. So that's kind of like a teaser there. So I myself have been guilty of this from personal experience. And that's why now as I've gained a better, better understanding of how to think and how to examine information, I can see more clearly what is going on when others are doing the same. So we want to eliminate confirmation bias and not just assume that we're only looking for evidence that supports our claim or supports our preconceived notions. One more example, the Cambrian explosion. This was something that happened, I don't remember the exact timeline, but I think it was maybe two, two million years ago. It may, it may have been less, it may have been less than a million years ago. But at some point in the, in the past, there was this explosion where all of a sudden we went from a world where there was basically a lot of mon monocellular life and some very relatively simple co complex life forms to all of a sudden all these incredibly highly complex life forms just appeared out, as though out of nowhere as though out of nowhere as though they were actually brought to the planet as though it was a miracle and from my study i think that i have concluded that 
evolutionary theory is correct up to a point, meaning there, there is selective pressure, there is an evolutionary process that occurs over long periods of time. But that process cannot explain the Cambrian explosion. And so if you are someone who is stuck that, that evolutionary theory, genetic evolution through selective pressure is the only way to explain how life has evolved on this planet, then you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to explain things like the Cambrian explosion. It's simply, in, it does not fit that model because that model does not provide an explanation for how life forms can suddenly pop out of nowhere with no intermediate, no intermediary life forms, no, no process. So the only way to really, and I'm not saying I have the answers to, to how this happened, nor even if I was to offer an answer, I'm not suggesting that you should believe me as I said earlier, but if we're going to come to any understanding that's closer to the truth, then we're going to have to eliminate that confirmation bias that that Darwinian evolution can explain all of it when that's clearly not true. And this is one example. One more example, understanding causality. We live in a world of, that's based on causality. We live essentially in a causal universe. In fact, if you have studied the Hermetic tradition, the seven Hermetic principles, or if you've read the Kybalion, you will recall that the sixth principle is the principle of cause and effect. And essentially what this means is that nothing is happening by chance. There is a chain of causality associated with every occurrence. It's simply you may not be able to see the entire chain of causality from your perspective unless you investigate further. But it's also to understand that just because events are correlated does not mean that they are causal. A great example I'll borrow from, I think it was Professor Bart Kay, he came up with this example. He said, if you look at certain data, you can see how on certain beaches, maybe on a given beach, let's use Hollywood Beach as an example in Florida because I, used to, I was living there not long ago. So in the summertime, we may be able to see a high correlation between people getting sunburned and people buying ice cream. So a misunderstanding of causality would lead someone to say, well, we need to outlaw, we need to prevent people from buying ice cream in the summer because they'll get sunburned. We know that's ridiculous. You know that's ridiculous, but yet a lot of people make arguments, again, going back to this idea of health and nutrition in that realm, but in all realms, many people make arguments that correlated events point to causality, and that's not necessarily the case. Correlation does not equal causation. On the other hand, sometimes we don't understand the causality at play, and we need to dig deeper. We need to investigate further. We need to be open to gaining a deeper understanding of the relationship between events that we may not, but that may not be readily apparent until we dive in deeper. It's a tool in your life toolkit that allows you through, through your entire lifetime to avoid falling into certain traps of ways of thinking. So understanding causality is key because, again, we live in a universe of causality. What's interesting about that is you can come to see yourself as the causal factor to your own life's experiences, including the bad things that happen to you. And this is really crucial because it's a high level of spiritual development. When you see yourself as the cause point, as the causal factor, as the generator of your own experience. No, I'm not saying that you're generating the entire reality. We, we already know that that is false, but you are generating the reality within your sphere of influence. You are generating circumstances and creating circumstances based on your own choices. So you can come to see yourself as a causal actor in terms of what unfolds in your own life. All right, now we've gone through the first two steps of the trivium, which were the grammar and logic steps. And now we're ready to let the rubber hit the road. This is the rhetoric step, also known as the, the output step or the wisdom step. And that's a big hint towards what the true meaning of the word wisdom is. So. The essence of the rhetoric step 
is that based on this new knowledge that we've acquired, this in new information, and then based on updating our model, our understanding of ourselves and of reality, our working model, we now can modify our behaviors and our actions so they can come more in alignment with this new understanding. And when we've more closely approximated how reality works, in other words, we've come closer to the truth, then the consequences of the behavior choices, and there are consequences always, we're going to experience more favorable consequences. We're going to experience more joy and more freedom, and we're going to suffer less and cause less suffering. This is really the point where causality meets effect and where reality is manifested based on our internal mindset, mindset and mind state. It's also really important to understand that this process is continuous. It's cyclical, it, it never ends. It never ends. And we should always remain open to new knowledge. And sometimes you, like me, are going to have to admit that you were wrong about something. And that can be tough, particularly for the ego, particularly if the ego is overactive because the ego does not want to be wrong. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be wrong. So it's a continual process of gaining new knowledge, gaining a better understanding of the knowledge, both the new knowledge, but also what we've already learned, and then adjusting our behaviors accordingly. I had hinted earlier that we saw a clue to the true meaning of wisdom, and here it is. Wisdom is right action. Wisdom is right action, meaning wisdom is action that is more closely aligned with what is true and what is right. And the degree to which we can act wisely is the degree to which we know and understand the truth. Nobody is perfect. I'm not saying that we are. I'm not saying that we can get it right all the time. Obviously, we can't. But we can strive for, we can aim for that. And you can think of it again like a degree something that's constantly increasing over time. So as you get better and better at knowing what is true and understanding it, your ability to act with wisdom, act wisely, increases. This is one of the reasons why wisdom is often associated with age, because it does take some time to cultivate wisdom. Now, can someone as a young child be wise? Yes, they can for a number of reasons. They can be a quick study. They can also draw upon what they've learned. They may be able to reactivate learning even from previous lifetimes. They may be able to, through beneficial circumstances, gain understanding more quickly. So yes, there is no specific age at which someone becomes wise, but it is also true that generally we become wiser through age because it does take time to learn all the things that we need to learn. So what better incentive to get a head start? What better incentive to start right now to improve your ability to learn rather than waiting so that you can suffer less starting right now so that you can experience more joy and more freedom and create more freedom in the world starting right now. In the other two steps of the trivium, we talked about the negative expression of each. So in terms of rhetoric, folly is the negative expression of rhetoric. Folly or acting foolishly is what leads to suffering, acting in opposition to that which is true. So the fool is the one who attempts to act in contradiction to the truth. And of course, the fool will suffer as a result. Someone who is stuck in ego is often going to resist changes in their behaviors, despite the fact that they may be exposed to new knowledge or may have the ability to gain a new understanding. So when you're stuck in ego, it's harder to discard things that you know 
you now know are, are, no, are not true, even if you thought they were in the past. It's a tough pill to swallow. And if your ego is overactive, being able to say those powerful words, I was wrong, becomes more and more difficult. And that's why the ego is a force that can lead you down the path of folly if you're not careful about it. If you've been paying attention, you noticed that the trivium is literally showing us how we are collectively co-creating our shared reality together. Each of us within the individual sphere of, our, of influence that we have, in other words, within our small bubble within that greater reality, but also collectively all together we are creating it. So when you look at the world today the way it is and when you make any kind of judgment or estimation of the world you might say as I have and others that clearly this is not the best that we can do, clearly this is not ideal, in fact this is a world, a civilization that's based on lies and deception, then this points back to the fact that we have no one to blame but ourselves because we did not properly understand how it works and we, then we, did, not, we did not gain a, an accurate understanding of reality and then act accordingly. It's really that simple. So any blame, any responsibility falls back on our shoulders collectively and each of us individually and that means you who's watching this and me and everyone else. We're, we're making this all happen together. So if we want a better reality, we need to improve our ability to generate it through the trivium. So again, just to emphasize this point, the quality of our collective experience, in other words, what we're experiencing and how, how much joy, how much freedom, how much growth versus how much suffering and pain and enslavement so that quality of our experience, all of us together, which we can call the state of the world, it's basically an aggregate function. It's, it's like a mathematical, mathematically precise function where we aggregate, aggregate together all of our combined abilities, the output of each of us individually, and then we aggregate it all together. So if you're paying attention to what I'm saying here and you're able to read between the lines a little bit, you know how important you are in this equation. You can see what your role is in this process. You can see how and why your ability to grasp and understand this process is so critical if you want to ever be the cause point of change in the world, if you ever want to be the causal factor and not just the effect. It is not an accident. It is not just by chance that the trivium has been expunged from all of mainstream institutions of education from the public school system this is no accident this was all done very intentionally because the dark occultists of whom I have spoken many times they know how this all works they know that the trivium is a model for explaining how we are creating reality together. And they know that the primary cause point is the mind, as per the first principle, the principle of mentalism. The all is mind, the universe is mental. Again, referring back to the same tradition, which is simply a, a pointer to the truth and not actually the creator of truth. But we live in a mental universe. And so the dark occultists know this, and they know that in order to hijack our reality, and to create a reality based where we are all suffering and enslaved, they have to destroy our ability to, to create that reality through knowledge, through knowledge, understanding, and ultimately wisdom. And it's a no-brainer for them that the trivium needed to be removed from all educational institutions, as it has been and continues to be that way. And this is why it's very likely that if you are watching this, whether you're a a young child or a teenager or an adult or at any age in your life, this is why it is 
more likely than not that this is the first time that you've been exposed to this information. And now you can see why I've chosen to, to dedicate my life to sharing this knowledge, this important knowledge with you and with others. Because I am not a dark occultist. I do study the occult and I want to understand it. I want to understand them and I want to understand all of reality. And I know based on my own experience how important this is. And I know that by sharing this with you, essentially I am helping to quote unquote level the playing field. I am helping to bring humanity back into our power as creators. And you are powerful and you are a being of infinite value as I have said in the past. So the dark occultists have simply removed this tool from education and that creates a power differential. That creates a power vacuum because they know it and you don't. And guess what happens as a result? If you connect the dots, you know exactly what's gonna happen. All children should be taught the trivium from a very young age. Is there a lower age limit below which the child may not be able to fully grasp this? Yes, I'm sure there is. But as long as you're sharing information and knowledge that is true, then no harm can come to them. Now, obviously, in context, education is both an art and a science, and we should tailor the lesson based on the, the individual. And that's where the real learning occurs. But I will just say this as a blanket statement that all children, regardless of how you break that down, should be taught the trivium from a very young age and this is why I encourage you, if you are an adult or even a parent, then you should share this certainly with your own children, but even with a larger audience and expose this to as many kids as possible and allow kids to gain this understanding. And I can guarantee you that as more people, young and old, start to really, really grasp this, this concept of the trivium, then you are going to start to see that ripple and cascade through our reality in ways that we can scarcely imagine. And I'm talking in a good way. I'm talking in a great way. I'm talking in a way that, that those of us who have been wanting for good to break through and to defeat evil to happen, that we, have, we would have a real chance of doing that once this happens. We will have a chance. So go and teach this to as many kids as you can and watch and see how they flourish and how we flourish. Question everything. Become someone who's inquisitive. Become someone who doesn't take anything at face value. Believe in nothing. Not in any religion, not in any authority other than yourself. You are your authority. You are the one that can find the answers for yourself. You have that ability. The only thing you should believe is in yourself and your ability to learn and understand the truth and to be your own authority and ultimately to be your own savior. But that is it. Everything else is open to question. It doesn't mean again that you're gonna openly reject things. It simply means that you're not gonna buy into something until you've actually vetted it. Coming back to what I said earlier, be always and forever open to having been mistaken. To having been mistaken about something you thought, something you thought you knew, some assumption you made based on your prior knowledge and understanding. Be always open to say those three most powerful words of all, I was wrong. Great, so now as we come into the home stretch and start to come to the conclusion of today's lesson, what I would like to do is share with you a few specific strategies they're going to allow you to optimize your results when you start to put this process to use, meaning when you start to incorporate the trivium in your own life. And of course, if you've been paying attention, as I'm sure you have, you know that I've already been doing this throughout the entire presentation. But now what I want to do is hone in a little bit more specifically and share with you some ideas that I think will really further and deepen your understanding even more. Number one, become a lifetime student. Never stop learning. Never dismiss new knowledge. Always be open to having been wrong. 
always seek to improve your working model of reality. See, it's really all about your mindset. It's really all about your state of mind. And what I'm describing to you here is a mindset of someone who is open, open to learning, open to exploring, to discovering, and of course to experiencing what life has to offer. Now, if you're a young child, this probably, for, for many young children, this might seem a bit obvious because we're born into the world largely with this state of mind. This is our natural state. It is only through time, through indoctrination, through some types of experiences that we can have in life that this is essentially beaten out of us. But really, I'm here to reaffirm you that in terms of that ever seeking of wonderment, that natural inherent curiosity, these are things that you should never grow out of. And actually, you can use them to your advantage as you move forward in life. So if you've lost a bit of that for whatever reason, and I know that that can happen and it's happened to me, what I want to do is invite you to rediscover the joy in learning. And I want to invite you to approach life with open-eyed curiosity and wonderment. And remember what Socrates said when he said, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. Number two, question everything. Accept no authority except truth itself. Do not believe others, no matter how convincing their arguments. Instead, make an effort to authenticate the veracity of their claims. And as I have said many times, and I'll repeat it now, this all applies to me in context, just as it applies to you. Do not believe me. Do not believe a word I say on this or any of my videos or presentations. Simply take what I'm sharing with you today, simply take this information in, and then go off and do your own research, do your own experimentation to arrive at the correct answer. This is the principle of self-defense facing inward within your own mindset. You are defending your own mind. You are defending it from being co-opted and from believing in lies and, mis and deceptions that would otherwise take you off the path. And this is the proper and correct use of your mind as your property, which it is. So I wanna invite you to embody this mindset wholly, even as you explore the world and yourself. Look within for answers. You have within yourself an amazing capacity to heal, to grow, to create, and to thrive. Unlock your inner potential. And I'm here to tell you from personal first-hand experience how true this all is because this is the journey that I've been on and this is what I have discovered for myself. I have discovered and continue to discover my own ability to heal myself. I am my own doctor. I am my own doctor and often I am my own teacher. It's not that we don't rely on anyone else. Of course, I have teachers, I have the advisors, I have people that I count on, and you should too. But they are not a substitute for your innate abilities to heal yourself and to find the answers that you need to find in life for yourself. And in fact, as a being of infinite value, you need to look at yourself as an equal to everything in creation. You are my equal. You are the equal to any person, any other person that you can think of that is alive today or has lived in reality, no matter how great their accomplishments or how low. We are all equals. We are in fact equal to the animals and we are equal to any beings that live, that may seem greater than us because they are either bigger or, or they access more dimensions or they're more advanced in their technology or their intelligence. Regardless, we are all 
equals and you are an equal with all of creation you are a being of infinite value and you have a potential that you have scarcely started to tap into so i want to invite you to do that and specifically when looking for answers you can find them within yourself i want to thank you so much for your time today and your attention if you got a lot of value from this video and i hope you did please like the video also please leave a comment share it with your friends and if you haven't done so subscribe to the channel or follow me wherever you're watching this these small acts mean a lot they mean a lot to me but they also mean that this video will be seen by more people so your engagement in this video is actually going to help me share it with more people and i appreciate that if you've been following my work for some time or maybe even if not and you feel like you've gotten a lot of value and you want to help me to do this work even more powerfully to be able to reach more people and to be able to double down on what I'm doing and, and create even better educational material and even better resources then I want to invite you to consider perhaps making a donation. You can go to my website freedomvibe.art slash donate to find out more information. Maybe you would like to sponsor one of my upcoming presentations either you yourself or vis-a-vis -vis your brand or your business sponsoring a product or service. You can do that with sponsorship. Go to freedomvibe.art slash sponsor to find out more information. You can also hire me to help you with coaching and consulting related to your own work to create and publish video content of this or any valuable nature. So I invite you again to go to my website freedomvibe.art where you can find out more information about all of this. Once again, the website freedomvibe.art and if you need to if you have a desire to reach out to me for any reason, I invite you to send me an email david at freedomvibe.art. Thank you once again. It's been my pleasure to spend time helping you today. It's been my pleasure to present this material to you today and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care.